every one of our lives some way, somehow over the years and they continue to do that and we're thankful that you brought them into our lives Lord be with the service that uh, we might be able to just give a little worldly thing of honor to him because we know in glory he's going to get a great crown of righteousness and we're thankful for his faithful ministry be with us here this evening in Jesus name we pray Amen. You may be seated. So even I would sort of to do both. Let's see if this works like no. Try again to make us a quick sound check. Sure. Hi there. Very good. We got it. Hello. Awesome. Thank you. It's it's all yours. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Daryl. I I um I enjoy hearing some voices in the singing that I recognize, and I I can't see you, but I know you guys look great because uh, there's Sarah's there. So hi, Sarah. Call me later. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a privilege to be able to to speak to you for just a couple of moments. And <laughs> for all of us feel the nostalgia, right? Brother, there's a big nostalgia moment. Um, just thoughts come into my mind as I think of you and I even think of the space that you're in. And it, it goes all the way back to the couple of months before I married Sarah. So we're in 2008. And I, re I remember going into Pastor Dan's office and um, looked around and there's a picture of the family up there and there's his books and his sermon notes and just different things around there. And, and that, the, the feeling was very strong for me, looking at all of that, looking at his life, uh, represented kind of in physical space there, the people that he loves, uh, the work that he does, the ministry that he's had. And um, I looked at all of that, and I thought, I, I want this. I, I want to serve the Lord like this. I, I want to raise a family like this. I want this. That thought stuck with me. So that 2008, um, 16 years, and, and that thought has stuck with me. I want this. That, the passage that came to my mind when I thought about just taking a couple of minutes to speak with you guys um, in respect to his ministry and in respect to what God has done among you, I thought of Jeremiah 23. And so if you've got your Bibles there, you can open your Bibles or open your phones to uh, Jeremiah 23. And if, if you look down through the context of the passage, you've got early in the passage, right at, around the beginning, uh, you've got this beautiful statement about the, the, the Savior. Uh, I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And this comment, <laughs> it's a, just a sermon all its own in uh, verse 6. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. So the descendant of David will reign as a king and deal wisely and execute justice and righteousness. He will save Judah, and he is the Lord. 
our righteousness. <laughs> you know, what's the, the richness of that? The coming descendant of David is the Lord, and he will be our righteousness. Um, as you progress down the passage, you can see the language or the emphasis of the prophets. In fact, I'll try this since, since we're on Zoom anyway. Um, I'll just toss this up here, and you know, maybe this kind of represents it visually a bit, but you can look down the passage and you can see this pattern with the shepherds or the servants or the priests or the prophets. And it's a regular and recurring thing. Yeah, maybe I won't do that. It's not seeming to work. Um, but I got just highlight it with my voice. I mean, 23.1, you see shepherds. 23.2, you see shepherds. 23.4, you see shepherds. And you just progress down the passage. It's fairly obvious that in the context, we're doing a lot here with um, leaders. And you get it you get it again in verse nine. You've got the language of prophets and eleven. You've got prophet and priest. You've got thirteen prophets and prophesying. And in verse fourteen, you've got the prophets. Okay, it just flows all the way down. So the the passage is very much um, woven through with this language of leaders and the influence they have. I'll come back to that a little bit later because it tells us something about the leaders. When you get down to, I think, what um, is the center of the passage, or at least what I would like to look at closely with you, or just for a couple of moments here with you, around verse 28, he's talking about the word of the Lord, uh, Jeremiah 23, 28. And he just says, let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but who who has my word speak faithfully. Okay, and, and why could he have the confidence for someone to speak that way. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? It's not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And let me set that now in context. So the, the prophets and the priests and the leaders that you've had all the way through this chapter are false prophets. They're failing priests, they're deceptive leaders. And the flow of the passage goes then that judgment is going to fall on those failing leaders because they've they've spoken lies in fact uh one of the ways that it 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 confronts those lies is that that god says there's the comment in here why are they trading dreams with each other <laughs> um i think that that's pretty poignant uh one prophet has a dream i've dreamed i've dreamed and the other prophet says hey that sounds promising that's a good line about people like that. He grabs up the dream. They're just trading dreams with each other. The whole thing is absurd. And then this, this contrast, when you, when you get down to verse 28, it's striking and it's poignant. God says basically, fine, go at it, guys. The prophet that has a dream, if he wants to tell his dream, he wants to tell his lies, I give up. Tell him your lies. Tell your dreams. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna distort the truth anyway, I guess have at it. But the person that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. The logic goes, because when when my word gets spoken, you'll know it, and when the dreams get spoken, you'll know it. Another way of saying this is, God doesn't have to work over hard to defend himself from counterfeits. Because the true word of God eventually will out itself. And the fake, the false, the destructive eventually will out itself. You'll know the true word of God when you see it. Now, that can go on for a long time. Some people are really good at faking it. But apparently, God's willing to say at this point, fine, we'll put it out there. But the person that has my word let him speak it faithfully. Why? What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like the fire, saith the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You'll know it when you see it, because it's the true word. And, and that's the thread or the thought that, that just occurred to me when I thought of uh, your pastor, when I thought of Pastor Matt, boy, and I thought of what has, has been the keynote of his ministry. Okay, so um, people can get along in ministry doing a lot of things. 
and um, they can they can run on charisma, they can run on programs, um, they can run on a, a lot of froth if they want. I mean, you can do a lot of things. Um, you can even kind of motivate people or get people excited by ideas that are true enough, ideas that maybe would lead them in the right directions. Kind of the, the really scary idea. If someone says, I think I know what people need. Like, you know, I see an imbalance here, and so I think I know what the antidote to that is. Sometimes people think they know a message that will help someone. And, and they could enter the ministry with a feeling, I, I just want to go out and encourage and help people. And so I'll, I'll try to gather up some things that I think might be a help. And, and, and the reality of faithful ministry is it's, it's fairly simple in this sense. If you have the word, speak it and speak it faithfully. Speak the true words of God that transform people's hearts. God's words are incomparable to anything else. They stand it out. They stand out on their own two feet. They stand out as distinctive. I just kind of, I got a little bit interested in this, um, kind of running down some of the other ways that scripture describes itself, or I just say metaphors, like language of scripture that gets used for describing the word of God. We've got a number of different places where you, you get this kind of thing. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is alive, it's quick, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it, it, it pierces, and it divides. So comparing the word of God to a sword, right? If this passage compares it to a rock or, or a fire, you can, you can compare it as well to a sword that, that cuts, that exposes. You can compare it to the second Corinthians 10 and the weapons of warfare, similar to the sword language, that, that will bring down strongholds. You can compare it to Isaiah 55, like rain and snow that come down from heaven and water the earth and bring forth life and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. You can compare it to a fragrance, 2 Corinthians 2, 16, a fragrance that brings life. And, and then you come here. And the language of a fire, um, the, the language that it, it purifies, it exposes. You pick this up in 1 Corinthians 3, right? The, the, the empty work of wood, hay, and stubble will be burned as with fire. It won't stand up to the test. And that would connect with all kinds of patterns across scripture. You've got, you've got the pattern with the burning bush at Sinai, and the temple at Pentecost, and, and, and the, the one in Revelation 1 has eye, is like a flame of fire. Nothing stands up to the test. Nothing stands up to the test unless it's true. The presence of God, burning fire, probably has the idea of purifying here. But, but the, the same fire can be purifying or judgment, right? That notion of whatever it is false is burned away. And then you also get this concept like in Jeremiah 29, that his word was in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary with holding it in. The fire could be purifying and judgment or <laughs> the language of the disciples after they walk away on the road to Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us? It's, it's a fire that burns in the bones. Somehow in a joyful, warming, beautiful, purifying way. Is not my word like a fire? And it burns away and it purifies. It also brings life and hope. And this language as well here in Jeremiah 23, is it not like a hammer that breaks the rocks? So you've got extended patterns multiple times in, in Scripture that we'll talk about the hard heart, or the rebellious heart like a rock. So one of the patterns goes that, that God promises he will remove the heart of stone from you. I will give you a heart of flesh. That's in Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 11. Um, you have the language in 2 Corinthians 3 that the, the words are, are a letter from Christ written not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. In other words, the idea that the, the unregenerate or rebellious human heart is hard like a rock. And when you put that now into the context of, of what this is saying, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. 
Have you had those moments in your life where your own heart feels cold and dead, and it almost feels like, like spiritual truths can't get through? And, and then the promise, the word of God is so powerful, it breaks through all of that. See, and to bring that back around to what we're, I guess what we're commemorating or thinking about today, the, the power of any real ministry, if it's actual ministry, and if it's effective ministry, the power of any real ministry will have to be nothing else then. The, the word of God was spoken. And it was spoken faithfully, and it was spoken directly, and, some, and sometimes that burned as it went by, and sometimes that hurt like a hammer hitting the rock. But the word was spoken. <clears throat> the word was spoken, and it was spoken faithfully, and it was spoken truthfully. Remember the context here in Jeremiah 23 is in contrast to the false prophets. I actually kind of, in a weird way, I, I mean, that, that's all negative, right? Um, I, I kind of find hope in that, though. And I, in, in this weird way, I find hope in the fact that the, the reality of false, deceptive, counterfeit teachers, it's an ancient problem. It's a timeless problem. It's a problem that's always been with us. These human hearts are broken like that. So we're not just dealing with something that popped onto the scene in the last, I don't know, couple of decades. It's an ancient problem. But right alongside of that ancient problem, there is all there are also the Jeremiah's. There is also the ancient stream, the ancient pattern of people who spoke the word of God faithfully. And they did it, whether it was popular or whether it wasn't. They did it, whether it was easy or whether it wasn't. They spoke the word of God to you. And that's also your pastor. <laughs> he has, over these decades, spoken to you faithfully the word of God. Like a fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock. He's spoken a word to you. And in that, he's given you the very best gift. I would I would miss the passage, or I would have um, I would have not covered the passage correctly if I didn't look in context and I, I didn't highlight what came at the beginning in verse five. The days coming with the righteous branch, where Judah will be saved, Israel will dwell safely. The Lord our righteousness. What I started off with some of those patterns, and and actually beyond that, if you if you kept on looking, you would find patterns. How about patterns like this? The false shepherds contrasted with John ten, the true shepherd. That, that actually takes care of the sheep in, in contrast to the hirelings, the people who just take advantage. If, if you have, and I know you have, been deeply enriched by God's ministry to you through Pastor McAvoy's investment in you, let that be just a, one reminder or one expression of the fact that, that what he has pointed you to over those years is none other, none other than the Savior. The Savior is what has made this ministry precious. The Word is what has made this ministry precious. And you can look back on those realities with gratitude and joy and thanksgiving. He pointed you to the ultimate, eternal, saving Savior. The one who gives life, the true and, and, and perfect shepherd of the sheep. We're just going to end up with um, a, a thought or two, maybe, here that would, I hope, be helpful in some way. And this is kind of in the mode of, um, I would guess, just encouragements that are specific to, to what we're celebrating or commemorating today. And the first thought goes, if there's something you've learned from this pulpit over the years, or if there's something that you take with you, from the ministry that you're, you're looking back on and remembering. Let it be this, let it, let it be the, the confidence and the knowledge that the power behind any faithful pulpit is always biblical truth. I mean, good, good public speaking is nice. I, I, I teach guys how to, 
how to speak well, how to communicate their ideas well, one of the things we work on. Good public speaking can delight, it can astound, it can encourage, it can, it can grab our attention, it can make us laugh, it can cry, it can motivate us to take action, it can change our thinking and our feelings and our emotions. Public speaking is powerful, it can do a lot of things. But only the true word of God can save a soul. Only the true word of God can transform character and bring a broken human being into relationship with God and lead them to eternal life. And, and if this pulpit over the last decades has accomplished something powerful in your soul and done something deep within you, Pastor McAvoy would be the first to affirm it. it it's, it's, it's not him, it's the power of the word of God that he faithfully spoke. Thank God for it. And, and I remember some years ago when we were in the Philippines, um, I was part of a handover. It was, we, we took a church uh, over for a period of about a year and a half, and the, the previous pastor and the handover service, which Pastor McAvoy was present for, that's cool. Um, at that service, the, the pastor who handed over handed it over just said to the people of the church, said, if, if you wanted to do something here as a statement of like a, a memory or a remembrance or gratitude or something like that, if you wanted somehow, I don't know, to express gratitude to me, your very best way to express gratitude, take, take the things that I talk to you about and go live them. And, and that would be the very best expression of gratitude. If, if you're looking today and you're grateful for Pastor McAvoy, I am, I know you are, then take the truths and go with those truths. And that, that does connect with uh, a second thing I'd want to say. God's people ought to be thankful for the gift of good shepherds. Don't take them for granted. T times like this call for gratitude. And it's one of the weird ironies when it's just sort of happening along the way and um, someone, if someone is truly faithful, you know, it's kind of, the, the concert pianist makes playing the piano look easy. Why? Because that's, he's good at it. When, when somebody is truly faithful, you don't, I guess you don't really see the impact of the miles as they run those miles. You don't really see it because they're just staying faithful. And it's just another Sunday, it's another sermon, it's another hospital visit, it's another wedding, it's another funeral, it's another difficult goodbye as someone leaves or a joyful addition when someone joins. And, and the years go by and the clock flies by and you sort of forget to notice the strain. You sort of forget to notice the immensity of God's gift because they're just doing what they do. members of, of, of Hanover, God gives shepherds as a gift, and he gave you a good one. You got a good one, you got a good one for a good long time. God took care of you, and you've been blessed, and, and you ought to thank God for that. You ought actually later on this evening to go home and take time and specifically and directly thank and praise God for the gift that he gave you over these decades because it was a good one. And that takes me to the last thing I would encourage you about, and, and it's something you already know, you already feel this, but as you as you continue your search as a church, um, right, I mean, it could be tempting, you could, <laughs> you, could, you could be tempted to go look for a carbon copy, you won't find one. Um, your, your pastor is, is a, a uniquely good gift, and you're not going to find a carpet copy, so don't try. <laughs> it is one of the weird things about pastoral searches that we, we tend to, to see all the things around the core, and we forget about the core. So, I mean, you know this. You find a man that, that fits the qualifications. You find a man that um, fulfills what Scripture describes of a pastor. I think this passage would would push you in this direction. If there's if there's something you're looking for desperately, you gotta find it.
brothers and sisters, find a man who will preach the word. Find a man that will put the word of God before you and, and, and set it before you so that it's a fire and it burns in your heart. So it's a hammer that breaks the rock. Find a man who will give you not ideas and thoughts and opinions, but give you a man that will preach the word. That's what you want. That's what you need. It's the only thing worth going to church for. Find a man who will do that for you. And, and, and by God's grace, he'll lead you. To all of you, we thank the Lord for you. And to Pastor McAvoy, we're grateful for the example you've given us, given to all of us. And we're delighted for the, the blessing we've had of benefiting from your ministry. And we know that we'll continue to, bless, to be blessed by the words that you've spoken, by the example that you've lived. Thank you. Changing of the guard. Here we go. So, thank you so much for for that. The number of people have wanted to say a little bit about the pastor, how it's impacted their lives, and we'll we'll go through. I've had a couple of people uh, write them down, and so I'll read those first, and then I'll tell you who's who's come up, and we'll take the microphone around just so you don't have to get up and logistics, and we'll go from, we'll go from there. So the first one I have, uh, Kingston sent me something. I said, well, you're going to be there. And he's like, no, you read it. It'll be too emotional. Well, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> no, Kingston writes, this is, thank you, Pastor. And this is Janice for 27 years of faithful service at HBC. We remember how you made us feel welcome the first time we visited HBC in September 2014. You both quickly followed up with a visit to our home and spent time with us to know us personally in a genuine, caring way that led us up to membership. The first dinner at our place, we remembered how we reached out to a friend of ours to find out what we can serve American guests and made noodles and got an apple pie for dessert. You <laughs> made us feel at ease when you shared that you enjoyed Indian food and even took references of Indian restaurants to try out authentic Indian food. Over the many visits at each other's place, there was love and fellowship as we shared our experiences. You even ate with your bare hands. <laughs> Thank you for your genuine love and care. Mrs. Janice, you went out of your way to help Merlin take part in the ladies' fellowship and Bible study. When you learned that we had a constraint in transportation, you volunteered to come pick Merlin up from our apartment in Short Pump every single time it occurred right from 2014 up until recently when the Castro's moved close to us. Thank you for your investment in Merlin. You often reach out via email to check on her. She's always included a word of encouragement. You always wore a smile and were never short of a word of appreciation. Thank you for your investment in Emmanuel and Nate over the years in teaching them in teaching from the word of God and encouraging them to build their talents. Pastor, there is never a dull moment around you. <laughs> Thank you for building relationships with people and encouraging us to do so as well with fellow believers and visitors. We saw this as a priority in your ministry. You never compromised on the word of God and always set high standards. You are a great shepherd in gently nudging us when there are areas of improvement. You spotted areas of talent and helped nurture it by offering support feedback, and encouraging us to serve each other by taking part in various aspects of ministry. You lead us as a servant leader, always setting a great example. In seeing your children serve our Lord, there were times we wished we were there when you were actively parenting. Thank you for being there for us 
in moments of need and pointed us back to Jesus in all situations. Thank you for keeping the word of God afresh in our hearts and building our love for it. Thank you for selflessly thinking about the future of this church when you made a significant decision to retire voluntarily. Mrs. Janice and yourself will be sorely missed at HBC, but you have taught us well to put our trust in our Lord who will use all of this for his glory. Please be assured of our prayers and we request the same. We hope to see you back here sometime soon in the future, God willing. Kingston, Berlin. Uh, the next one I have is from Rebecca Tate. She was here, but her back was hurting. She said, I don't think I can stay the whole time. So she wrote it out, and I think I transcribed it enough, so we'll, I'll try to do it justice here. She said, when we came to Hanover Baptist Pastor, you and your family had just come here. We had enjoyed you being our pastor. I have enjoyed it. I'm glad you preached the word. Some preachers don't. Thank you for all you and Janice have done for us. You visited me in the hospital when I fell down our steps. You visited Renzer when he had been in the hospital. You and Janice always check on me to see how we are doing. You came to visit Renzer when he was on the hospice on the hospital bed at home. You came when he died and were at the funeral home when we were making arrangements. Thank you for doing the funeral service for him. Thank you for the message you preached. Thank you for caring about us. We wish you, we wish you the best. And now I've got a microphone. Rick, are you here? There it is. Okay. We'll shuffle this over here. When I came to Hanover Baptist Church in 2003, uh, I was a relatively new Christian. And I just want to say that over the course of the years, uh, through pastors' faithful teaching and preaching the Word of God, uh, I believe I actually grew spiritually. And I, I just, you know, I praise the Lord for that because the pastor always does preach the Word of God and gives you the truth. And um, on a more personal note, um, I, I'd say I, I've got, you know, a number of friends, but. Um, None more dear than the Mac boys. I, I mean, over these years, they, they've been there, uh, supported me through some times, and helped me in situations that I don't think anybody could or would have. So I, I praise God for that, and I just, I just want to say thank you to them uh, for their dear friendship to me. And uh, my prayer for them is that uh, God will continue to bless them uh, as they go on into a new chapter of life and ministry for the Lord, and I know he'll be with them through that time. Many of you know I was on the pulpit committee, actually I was the chairman of the pulpit committee that brought Pastor Dan here from Pennsylvania. What a blessing that was. Little story, and I've shared this story before. You know, in those days we didn't have computers like we have today. Uh, it's hard to believe. He mailed me his resume. And when he mailed me my, his resume, my dog chewed it up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't kidding when I called him back and said, my dog chewed it up. <laughs> so he sent me another one. That's what this is. This resume is dated August 27, 1996. And I don't know if you have a copy of this, Pastor, but if you don't, I'm going to give you this for your, for your records. So that's his resume. I do want to thank the Pastor for all he's done for us. I was in this church as a deacon when he came. I've been on the advisory uh, board. I've been a Sunday school teacher. I actually taught a couple of his children. And all through this time, Pastor has kept his heart the way it should be kept. He's preached the word of God to each one of us. 
He's made each one of us grow. It's been, a, it's been a blessing. I've seen him go through many successes. I've seen him have some bad situations sometimes. <coughs> but all through it all, he's kept his heart right. He's kept himself in the word of God. And he's preached to us. I want to thank him for being with my family when we've gone through difficult times. He's very close to my family at times. He helped my grandson, Tommy, for a while. He used to go to lunches with him at McDonald's. What a blessing. I do want to thank you for all you've done. I want to thank you for being you. I want to thank you for being in the Word of God. I want to thank you for your heart that's always been towards Jesus Christ. And really, most of all, I want to thank you for being my friend. Because you've been my friend for 28 years. I'm not going to stand. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Um, like Tom said, I, we've known Pastor and his family for over 27 years. And with their, when they came here with their young children that were just you know, we were trying to, Josh and I were trying to figure out the heights and the, and the ages and everything. And um, he came here to our church, and of course, it was a change. And, and you, had to, you had to change, and, and, but we grew. We grew to love him, we grew to respect him, and we grew to love his preaching, which we have always loved through the years. That I'm going to really miss. And um, now that his children, they all have children of their own. So he's qu got quite a few grandchildren. We, Janice and I used to always say that uh, we try to beat each other out with uh, getting the grandchildren and everything. Um, yeah, he won, so. <laughs> <laughs> but Pastor was always there. I don't know what's because I can't see him. <laughs> He was always there for our family, and like Tom, uh, Tom said, for our grandson, he had a heart problem. He almost died when he was born, and, and uh, Pastor was there. He was there for the family. He was there at the hospital, and then Tommy had subsequent operations and everything. So it, Pastor and Janice were just always there for us, no matter, no matter what you needed. And you were always, if, if we needed something and called you for operations for me, my foot, whatever, and uh, Tom's shoulder, we've had our share of them. But you were always there for us and, and Janice too. And uh, very loving and caring pastor. And something Joel said, which I was gonna say too, um, <coughs> If it, if it wasn't, or if it isn't in the Bible, he's not going to preach it. He only preaches what's in the Bible. And he's led of God to do that. And um, we loved his preaching, like I said. And when we went away, <coughs> when we go on vacation, we would miss it. And there just wasn't anybody else like him. And he always had a sense of humor. <laughs> So either he teased me or I teased him or whatever, but he did, he always said. And Janice, the most caring and loving person to all us ladies, and all you ladies know that. She's very loving and very caring, doing the Bible classes, the Dove Fellowship, and um, our garden trips. We always would do garden trips, as I know some of you others have done. He truly, you truly cared for your church and the people in it. There was no question about that. And we will dearly miss both of you. And we know that you're going to go on to serve the Lord. And but we will miss you terribly. And not only your past, uh, our pastor, but you were such good friends of Tom and I. We love you both. <coughs> Andrew. I'm going to read this. Pass 
say, Mrs. James, thank you for faithfully serving God in our church. You have consistently pointed us to God in His Word, no matter what situation we're facing. Pastor, thanks for preaching that is right to the heart rather than merely intellectual and theoretical on one hand or just emotional and positive. Thanks for preaching the whole counsel of God, for challenging our thinking even on difficult subjects, but making it practical to our lives, for not leaving us thinking, what, what is the point? Thanks for helping us think biblically about the many things our church and family have faced, for showing us in word and in action that the Bible applies to every situation in our lives. I love your constant emphasis to love Jesus. Finally, thank you both for always taking time for our kids and families. They love you as our pastor's family, but also as friends. They have repeatedly asked when, when we will see you again. We will continue to pray for you in this next chapter of God's plan for your lives. Um, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Armando. A lot of things to live up to here because uh, <laughs> well my uh, I, I just I just want to express my gratitude to the pastor and uh, and Ms. McAvoy it's a simple thing I, I moved here two years ago um, and I didn't pretty much I didn't like anything about that move <laughs> nothing so I was it, it was just not good so I I was uh by Pastor Reed and Pastor Manning from Fredericksburg and Roanoke, they told me this. You need to establish yourself with Hanover Baptist Church. The reason being is, is because regardless of all, you know, the, the thing that you're going through, you will be led to the scriptures, you know, by Pastor McAvoy. And then I also received a great gift that Ms. McAvoy sure uh, led my wife, you know, in, in the scriptures. Uh, I mean, my wife, for the first time, she prays in groups. Uh, you know, she leads prayers. I mean, Ms. McAvoy really helped her grow spiritually, and Pastor McAvoy helped me grow because now, throughout these last two years, everything I take to the scriptures. There's nothing that I want to figure out there's nothing that, and it doesn't matter what, and, and I've done this recently with someone else, you know, that they, they call me and they share things, and, and I tell them, I have nothing but the Word of God and the Scriptures, and that's what was given to me, and that's the greatest gift. So, regardless of how the Lord, you know, put in our hearts to move here, Pastor McAvoy and Ms. McAvoy, I thank you because... You certainly have helped us grow spiritually. And there's nothing more than I can praise God for than you helping someone grow spiritually. That's what we all want. So thank you, Amen. Pastor and Ms. McElroy. Mrs. Gatchi and then Diana. Both together. Well, mine's very short because I felt like this said a lot when we had your 25th anniversary. So, who cares? <laughs> How do you say goodbye to people who have made such an impact on your life in many ways, especially spiritually? I've had the privilege of being under the ministry of three different pastors. The first one, and I do keep to the Bible. The second one taught me the importance of winning, of leading souls to Christ. Pastor, you have helped me to grow in each of these areas. And Janice, you've been such a support to us also. You're always there supporting Pastor and us. If I had to describe you, I would say you're like a cheerleader in a spiritual way. My prayers go with both of you as you enter to this next path. And I follow this verse today with y'all. Romans 6, I'm sorry. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you, the Lord bless thee, and keep thee. 
the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And you will be blessed. And yes, you have been there too many things in my life. And I thank you for your support. One of the things when I came to church here, I, I moved in about 91, 93, and um, it was uh, the person that had established the church here of God's Word, and he charged the pulpit committee, um, you know, well, he, one of his wishes, he didn't have a pulpit committee before he passed, but one of his wishes was that this church continues to preach the word of God. And that was on their minds as they looked for a pastor, is not to let it stray. That was something he was concerned about, not to let it stray to the you know words of the world, to find a man that believed the word of God and shared it. So I want to thank the pastor and Janice for everything they've done personally for me and my family over the years. I was here when he first came here with Janice, and um, it's been almost five years since my husband had passed away. And he passed away suddenly, but he and Janice came to the hospital and visited with me, and then they even came in to visit with him, but you know, of course, and they prayed with me over it. And it was an encouragement to me because I knew even if I didn't agree with it, that God had control over everything, no matter what the circumstances. And um, he's preached over seven funerals for my family. And each time I would call him, it was never, but I had something I'm doing <coughs> that day or this weekend or whatever. He was there with me and through each one of them, my brother or sister, my mom, my husband, and, um, you know, my nephews. And uh, so it was just knowing that he and Janice were there for me, and they were encouraging, and they would, um, Janice would just be there quietly, in her quiet way. And, uh, you know, they would call me and make sure that I was doing okay. And they meant that I was able to accept it, to know God's presence, and his comfort was with me. And they did so much follow-up on everything that happened, and I it didn't have to hesitate to call no matter what. They generated a confidence that they would be there through good times and bad, and I wish them well as they embark on this new chapter of their life together. And may God give them comfort, encouragement, and a true direction for his will at this point. Jennifer. She's been a godly example of a lady, wife, and mother. She is patient and kind, always genuinely interested and happy to hear about what is going on in your life. She has, 
She has always known all of the visitors by name and everything about them before I have even gotten over to shake their hands. <laughs> even the ones that are sitting right behind me. <laughs> um, in any situation, she always jumps, jumps right in and asks how she can help. She has been joyful with the children of our church and genuinely concerned for their hearts. From the youngest age, she has provided a firm foundation for them in Sunday school, showing them exactly where the lesson comes from in God's word. She has been a good friend to me, and I'm sure to all of you other ladies in the church as well. And um, Janice, we are excited for your next adventure, and we all love you, and we're going to miss you very much. I had to write down all this stuff. That... <laughs> no, I just wanted to say it was a, a little background from where where we stood. It was 22 years ago that Jennifer and I were married without a church. We knew the Lord, but we're unfocused and kind of wandering on our own. And so we set out to find a church. The first church we visited was Hanover Baptist Church. Amen. <laughs> Jennifer's brother had come here often when he was visiting, and he said, that's, that's a good, good church. And he really liked the preaching. That was, his, that was his. So we came. So the church was in the middle of nowhere at that time. Nothing was built up. It was all wood. Uh, it was nice enough. The people were friendly. The service, service was different from what I was used to. It was grown up. And when we left, Jennifer asked what I thought about the preaching. And I said, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the first impression. No, it wasn't. It was all, it was all. <laughs> Yet after months of visiting other churches, and we heard everything from like the thought of the week to the 10-minute sermon, we thought we'd try our Baptist church again. And this time, pastor's sermon smacked me right between the eyes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Expository preaching right out of Romans on grace. And to top it off, and God does this to kind of nod towards me when he's working, pastor ended his sermon with some analogy about astronomy. And I remember him casually tacking, well, I was thinking, this guy is a preacher and a scientist. And I really, I was like, this is awesome. And he tacked on at the end of it, he was, he was just reading it. It was a great point. And he said, I don't know if that's helpful to you or not. And he just moved on. But he didn't know it. God knew that was exactly what I needed. So we became members. Now the net net of 21 years is what everyone has said so far is spiritual growth. And the, the disclaimer is, God is not done with me yet, so this is not, we have not arrived. But all the glory goes to God, but he worked through you to do that. And it was everything from his preaching, but the way he would involve you to break you out of your mold. And when we first came, and he does this now, but it was really prominent, at least to me at the beginning. At the end of the service, he would randomly call on someone to pray. And I knew I was fresh meat. <laughs> I would have glad eyes were closed, heads were bowed. But I'd be thinking, don't call me, don't call me, don't call me. And then he'd say, Daryl, let's pray. Would you mind closing us in prayer? And then I'd pray. You learn that way. And then many other things that we did at church were foreign to me early on. So after we attended for a while, we started coming to the Sunday evening service. And back then, about once a month, we would go door to door soul winning. And Pastor had this huge map at the back of the, of the church with all the neighborhoods of where he visited and where we're going to visit. And I was terrified. <laughs> the pastor was steadfast, like, this is what we're doing for the work of the Lord. And I never would have volunteered to walk up to a stranger's house and give them the gospel if, if I had been pressed into it. And yet, in a sense, I think I did volunteer, but it wasn't to him, it wasn't to the church, it was to God. 
And it was his consistent labor in the Lord that slowly turned me towards serving the Lord as well. Through his living, my living changed. Like the music we listened to went from worldly to godly. I threw out so many movies, DVDs. Um, we changed how we dressed, our <coughs> church grew, how we raised and trained our children was integral. <laughs> You'd better start at two years old, he'd say. That's true. We learned how to pray and how to study the Bible. And before coming here, I knew the Bible inside and out. But pastor helped me know the author. And not only what to see what the words were saying, but the God who said them. But all of these things are just things, right? They're good things, and they're a means, but not to an end, but to point to Jesus. As the hymn says, the things of this world go strange, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And it seemed like it was every week, and I think pretty much every week, we would drive away from the morning service, and I'd say, that was an amazing message. I mean, it really was an amazing message because he connected God, he helped me understand that God is better. And even in those years, it occurred to me, and I would tack on, we need to pray for our next pastor. And that wasn't totally a spiritual motive, unfortunately, but I knew I didn't want to lose the gold mine of a preacher. I was on the pulpit pit committee before I knew it was fashionable. <laughs> But above all that, the theme of the sermon at, at week after week and sermon after sermon is always the same thing. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Trouble with your life? Look to Jesus. Don't know how to love someone? Look to Jesus. The world's falling apart? Look to Jesus. How many times has someone had to tell you to look to Jesus before it sticks? 21 years ago. That's so what I'm saying. But not to get all somber, I would like to share what I consider the top ten McAvoy -isms. <laughs> These would be kind of characteristics that you're most likely to hear in any given sermon. Right, the top, number ten, I don't know if these are in order really, but more than just a positive mental attitude. Right, you've heard that recently. Number nine, I like this one. If you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. I use that at work, too. <laughs> Number eight, don't be a Pollyanna. <laughs> if you know what you have, to, I had to look that up. This next one, well, this other one later. Number seven, don't get guilty on me. <laughs> Number six, plug in with me here. Number five, are you a Casper Milk Toast Christian? <laughs> that one I did have to look up. Who's Casper? Actually, I'm quite funny. Number four, it's not what's happening in you or what's happening to you, it's what's happening in you. And then uh, now this one has some acrobatics to it. <laughs> it's saying, Say no to self and yes to God. <laughs> Got a stretch before that. One. Oh, and, 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 and this one. <laughs> no, on the last one, number one, when he we close everything and he, we're praying and he says, "Amen." And amen. 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 <laughs> Praise amen. God for this. If, if you want to indulge me any further, I do have a limerick. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is a chance to limerick. The first thing you'll learn of Dan McAvoy, he doesn't treat preaching like a toy. He studies God's word to make sure you heard living through Christ is our joy. Now, so we do want to close this with a few presentations. We'll sing in a minute uh, a last hymn. Uh, but we want to commemor commemorate this night with, with three things. So just first, kind of more of, a, of an announcement. The deacons of the pulpit committee wanted to let the church know that even though this is pastor's last Sunday, we, continue, we decided to continue his paychecks through the end of the year. We, wanted, we thought that would be the easiest way to give him a monetary gift 
but also ease the burden yeah, through, through the rest of the year. So we're very, very glad to do that. Uh, a second pastor, if you can manage coming up here. This is something I've wanted to do for you for years, but this is, we kind of shared it at the Boulder Committee a bit and said this was a good time to do it. This is pretty cerebral, so we'll go, go ahead and open. <laughs> we went emotional, now we're just going to go very, you can get out. Uh, can, I, can I say a word first? Oh, yes. <laughs> this, this right there, that picture that was on the bulletin, that was not my doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm nothing against the picture, but I wouldn't have chosen that. But that's what happens when you retire, you know? I mean, you lose total control. <laughs> so, what I want to do, so this is First and Second Timothy are Paul's charge to a pastor. And so these are all the words of First and Second Timothy, and and they're sized based on how often they appear in the book. So you can start to I don't know if you can analyze it that much. The sentimental part of this, though, is the wood. This is is from the original sound system cabinet that we took apart. <laughs> so you'll have a bit of Hanover Baptist Church with you. And of course we have, this is the third thing. So because you like to give certificates and plaques to everyone for every reason, we, we thought that we would do that too. Now this is a real plaque, but it's still a plaque. Yeah, look at this. 27 years for your faithful, steadfast, and loving ministry for us at Hanover Baptist Church, Pastor Daniel S. But, um, yeah, thank you very much. You're very kind. We, we saw back there uh, some kind of a book with all your pictures. In. Not Maybe not everybody, but I, I don't know who all was there, but that's very kind. So thank you very much for that. And then somebody was over there and telling us that there's a, like a book of, I don't know, cards or that sort of thing. So thank you for that. These pictures around here. That is really a walk down memory lane, which was really pretty cool. And there's so many more, of course, that could be put up. But they're very special. Dedications, people, uh, you know, new members, things like that, baptisms. So, yeah, child dedications, all that stuff. Really, very, very thoughtful. <coughs> the meal was great. You all came. That was great. We had a tremendous, oh, I have no idea what the attendance would be this morning. The place was, you know, much bigger than often. And, uh, and then you all came back. It was great. To be really candid, when I heard there was going to be something at five, I thought, I don't know how many people are going to be there because usually, you know, we do something like this after the morning service. But this is great because we had more time. So, but just thank you very much. It is our privilege to be here. Really, honestly, is. I'd like to read a little passage of scripture and then we'll let it go. This is not talking about me. This is a, uh, a testimony in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Uh, from the Apostle Paul that meant, um, I don't know, it's just one of those passages that meant a lot to me uh, for a long time. <clears throat> he started by saying, uh, I am the least of the apostles, that am not to be meet or fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But 
So we, so we understand that context. But then he went on and said, but by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And uh, it goes on and says, his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether or I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. And I also very much appreciated, um, I, I don't, I, when I was listening to what Joel had to say, I don't know if this occurred to you, but I thought there are so many parallels with what I went over this morning in the message about false teachers and the truth and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, and I had no idea. That was, that was really pretty cool the way he did that because he's in where Idaho and his wife, Sarah, of course, is here, our second daughter. And uh, so how that all worked out, I don't really know, but he's there for a missions conference. So he's probably in a service now or going to it. So I'm very thankful for him. Another verse, just one more verse that I'll read and not really any comment, but um, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Last Sunday morning, I preached in Isaiah 50 and verse 7. You remember that? The Lord God will help me, etc. This verse has been a very, very powerful verse in my life for the last, I don't know, maybe five years. But Galatians 6, 14 says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not where it stops. And since I really came under the conviction of this verse, it's been interesting to me how very often I hear it quoted, but that's where it stops. And how very often I've seen this even on greeting cards or plaques or things like that, but that's not where it stops. What it says is, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Jesus died not just so that we could go to heaven, but so that in this world now, we can live like it. Amen. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I am unto the world. And I would just encourage you, don't be dazzled with all the glitter and all of the trinkets of this world. They're just not worth it. They're just not worth it. You can be popular, you can be prosperous. But what we want is at the end of this life, when we see Jesus, we want him to say, well done. No one will be worthy of that. No one. But he is worthy that we live like that. Amen. 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 Thank you very, very much for your kindness to me and my wife and then uh, Becky and Sarah and Josh and Chris all here and my sister Judy and Wayne. I hope you got to know them. Sue had to leave. Uh, and uh, then, of course, John and Becky's kiddos are here too. So I appreciate all but Michaela. So I think we well, back to somebody. Oh, you got a song. Yeah, we're going to sing a song. Good. Right. Sing, sing. Cool. I like to sing. <clears throat> we took that all good to that up. about faithfulness tonight, how faithful Pastor Dan was in the ministry to us, and one of the things that the scriptures tells us is we need to be faithful. 
Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim every one of his goodness, but a faithful man who can find? We found one. And may God continue to help him to be faithful. We're going to stand and we're going to sing this song, May the Lord find us faithful. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day, though we live though we die. Let's sing that song together as we close.